Kristen Lascola on Fireside Chats. Last week we had Kirk Jones. This week, Kristen Ooh. Lascola. So the Fallbrook campus really representing, although we kind of stole Kirk Jones. So I was going to say, he's not now. there anymore. <laughs> it's true. It's true. But you have been at North Coast in student ministries for 17 years now. Many of those years were with Kirk Jones. Um, what's, what's that 17 year journey been like for you? Well, it's, it's kind of surreal in that if you would have told me like when I was in college or when I was 18, 17 years from now, you're going to be a junior high pastor. I would have been like, I don't think so. <laughs> like That was not on my, like my plan, but um, it's just kind of crazy as you grow, you learn, um, like that God knows you better than you know yourself and like things, the journey that ministry has taken me on of like what I've learned about God and myself and what I was designed to do. I could have never picked it out for myself. I would have never known. So it's, um, crazy all with middle school too, which some would say is one of the hardest jobs in the church. Most people do not like middle schoolers and I can understand why. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like I, I get it. Um, I have my master's degree in understanding why people don't like middle schoolers. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Pretty much. Between you and Travis, that's like 103 years of youth ministry. So that's, and I, that's, that's who I learned from. I learned from the best. I worked for Travis for a few years and like that set me up to just run on my own. So I owe a lot to Trav. He was awesome. Heck yeah. That's awesome. And you, um, Kristen, you, your husband's name is Jeff. Yeah. You guys have been married for nine years now. Is that correct? Wow. Very good. Austin. How did you I've know? done, I've done my research, you know, there's a <laughs> gift in the mail for you on your anniversary. Um, and then you're a mom to two. Yeah. Br Brinley and Annika or is it Annika? Yeah. Well, you know, we say Annika, her teachers say Annika. So we told her if you want to correct people, correct them. But yeah, so she's seven, Annika seven, second grade. And Brinley is a very ripe toddler. <laughs> she's two and a half. Nice. So we're in town right now. It's okay. Nice. Yeah. Uh, I, I cannot imagine what that's like. I, every day just keeps blowing my mind with Piper. Piper's almost three months now and my life is mostly poopy diapers right now. So <laughs> <laughs> there's no running around or talking or, you know, being crazy or any of that right now. There's just massive blowouts in the car, which is just so fun. You know, my kids never had blowouts, but my kids had colic. Like they just uh, were the babies that cried and cried and cried and cried and cried. So, um, yeah, toddlerville it's especially during quarantine. It's been like the, like I, it's a mental health, uh, challenge for sure to be quarantined with a toddler. So I believe it. It's I believe it. Yeah. I know some of our students have little siblings and, uh, I, I think most of our sermons are, are just directly pointed at like, if you can't apply this anywhere else, apply it in your home <laughs> with yes. your little siblings, because I guarantee that's a test of patience and grace and applying the gospel in your life with your own siblings. That's gotta be Amen. intense, especially Amen. as parents too. But, um, okay. So a couple quick details. You, Kirk Jones blows my mind too. I, I always love starting out my interviews with him talking about his, you know, dodgeball championships in Las Vegas <laughs> and things like that. But you two are kind of two peas in a pod, Kristen. You, you're quite the interesting woman that when it comes to, you have a company called um, Doxy Love. Is that, no, Foxy Doxy. <laughs> Foxy Doxy, that's what it's called. Sorry. Um, Doxy Love is a much worse name for your company. And that it started with your love for, for dachshunds, right? Or yeah, as they say so, in Germany, the dachshunds, which wow. did you, do you know what that means? Yes, I do. Do you? I do. It means a uh, badger, badger dog. Badger hound. Very good. Oh, close. Close. Are you Googling stuff right now? You know, maybe... <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. I was Googling. I, I was Googling wiener dogs this morning. It's true, but they're fascinating. They were bred like 600 years them. ago 
to like go down foxholes and find badgers and rabbits. Yeah. I'm like, these dogs are legit. Well, people think they're just like little lap dogs um, because they're small, but they're hunters and they act like it. So yeah, I, I'm a dachshund enthusiast, as I like to say. <laughs> so mm-hmm. I've had dachshunds my whole life. We just got a new one. She's a very rare one. Her name is Shortcake. So you can follow her on Instagram. She has her own Instagram, Shortcake the Doxy. And wow. Okay. Is like my dream dog. But anyways, yeah, we have a company called the Foxy Doxies. So we, um, I conceptualize the designs and my husband draws them. And then he, um, he's a screen printer. So he does the art and then makes it to a screen and then puts it on a shirt. So I'm not an artist, but I have ideas. So we work really well together. Um, and then there's these things which people laugh and go ahead. It is okay. But there's dachshund races that are in, they're all over, but, um, there's a huge one in Texas. There's one in Huntington beach on the beach. That one's really fun. There's a couple in Temecula, like in the wine country every year. And we take our shirts and we sell them, um, at these dachshund races. And it's like the, it's like Christmas. It's like so fun to me because I'm like surrounded by dachshunds and I'm making money. I'm like, what? This is like (laughs) heaven, right? That is Uh, unreal. And so the, they actually like race these dogs, like they put them on a track and they race. Yeah. So they have them in like a little box with the numbers and then they open the box and they run out and they have like different categories, like, you know, puppies, one-year-olds, then they have the older ones. And then they have like these destruction competitions because dachshunds, because they're hunting dogs, they'll destroy like, like uh, stuffed animal toys, squeaky toys, stuff like that. So they time them how fast they can destroy the toy. That is unreal. This is seriously, I, mean, I could spend the entire fireside chats just talking about this, but for the sake of time and my own sanity, we need to move on. Um, okay. Wow. That I, I seriously, can I go to one of these? Can I just work the booth with you? I want to, I just want to watch one of these races. That sounds Have incredible. People. Yes. You Perfect. Will love Docs and lovers. I love it. Wow. That's fantastic. Okay. And then you, you launched a podcast this year and you, you put out like 36 episodes over COVID, which is seriously impressive. Just talking about your experience in youth ministry. And it sounds like from, I've, I've done a little bit of listening to this podcast. It sounds like your husband kind of pushed you into this. Yeah. And he still does. Shoved, every- maybe. He's like, all right, what's the episode on? You know, he's always pushing me. And that's why we have so many episodes because he's very, um, like, we have to record every single week. And I'd be like, I think we could take a week off, you know? And he's like, nope, we got to record. I'm like, oh. So yeah, he's the one. He's like, you could do it. Let's go. And again, we work really well together because he's a, also a videographer. So he sets it all up and he edits the video and he uploads it. So I just come with content. I'm ready to go. And then he takes over all the other stuff. So yeah, it's on, it's called ministry coach. And so that's the idea of like, you know, you mentioned I've been in youth ministry a long time and there were a lot of years where I was totally alone. Like I had no help and nobody would really, I mean, I'd reach out here and there, like to see if people could kind of come alongside and mentor. And there was just not a ton of people available or willing to do that. And I had wished that I had someone to walk me through, like, how do you do this? Like, what are good ideas? What are things you should be thinking about? So now that I have all the experience, it was hard to get. And I want to give that away for free now to the me that was 21 taking over a ministry and was just like trusting God flying by the seat of my pants subscribing to youth ministry magazines, like trying to get my hands on yeah. anything. I could. Cause it was like, I mean, the internet was there of course, 17 years ago, but there just wasn't as many resources like there, like there are now. So I felt like I earned my stripes very slowly. Um, 
and under a lot of pressure. So I kind of want to save someone as much trouble as possible if I can. <laughs> totally. Totally. That's awesome. Okay. Let me, uh, let me fire a few questions at you. Um, and I want, I want to hear your answers. Uh, these are questions that I like asking uh, and some brand new questions that I've never asked before. So uh, number one, if you were on a Miss Universe contest, what would your talent be? Um, cheerleading. Wow. Okay. Yeah. I would Another do thing you and Kirk Jones have in common. <laughs> That's the direction I thought you were going to go when you said two peas in a pod, because we were both cheerleaders and I'm still a cheer coach. I do private cheer coaching lessons. Um, and I miss do. it so much. I love cheer. So I think I would, I would choreograph a whole cheer routine and do it all by Heck myself. Yeah. I love it. That's <laughs> awesome. Okay. Uh, number two, what's been your favorite thing about COVID? I know there's been a lot of bad things and a lot of people are down on it, but I think there's also been some pretty incredible upside. So what's, what's been your favorite? Um, yeah, it's funny you ask. I, in the beginning, I started like a whole COVID gratitude journal to keep me, my head in that headspace of like, there's so many good things here. Um, probably basic, just, I like the more chill schedule. I realize how much time I save not driving to and from meetings or just like, I just feel like I got so much time back. So like, I have so much time to do everything I need to do for work. And then I've had so much time to like work out or like look at other interests or like you said, have time to do the podcast. Like it's just cool to slow down. I think that's been the biggest slowing down. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I love that. Um, okay. What's the best piece of advice you've ever been given? Oh, um, man, Austin, I wish you would have told me this question now. Like so many things are running through my mind. Yeah. But it's no uh, fun to prep you in advance, you know, <laughs> I know, right. Um, the best piece of advice I've ever been given I think it was maybe, and he probably doesn't even know he gave me <laughs> this advice, but Larry Osborne, I'm a huge fan. I love Larry. The goat. Yeah. I mean, I just feel like, and I'm a huge Chris fan, but like, I remember <laughs> Larry said a long time Strong ago. Strong butt. I, you know, Chris Brown's great and all, but <laughs> <laughs> Chris Brown? careful. Like the son's friend. in my ministry. Yeah. Like I love, I love my friendship with Chris. Larry is almost like this untouchable, like, oh, like, do you see me, Larry? You know? <laughs> so I think that's like, there's like this fascination or something, but um, he, like he said, find your voice. And I think um, like for me in ministry and just for me as a person, uh, like like, who am I? What is my voice? And what does it sound like? And getting in that lane. Um, I think for a long time, not just being super isolated in ministry. It was always this thing of like, trying to emulate somebody else. And I didn't value my self like, and what I brought to the table and what I sounded like. And over the years of really honing in on like, who am I? And realizing that what, who I am and what the way I think and what I bring to the table um, is valued and stay there because that's where I'm, I'm my best. Um, I think that was like a huge game changer for me. And that doesn't just apply to like, my job, you know, doing ministry, but like finding my voice as like a wife, like who I thought a wife was supposed to be, like when I first got married and who I realized, like who, what's my voice as a wife? What's my voice as a mom? I felt like, especially growing, growing up in the church, there was like these cookie cutter images that we were supposed to be and do. And that 
they're there's nothing spiritual to them. They're just people's preferences, you know? So yeah, I think, thank you, Larry. Yeah, I guess so. Maybe later on something else will pop in my head, but for now, I guess finding my own voice and being okay with that. Yeah, that's, that's so important, right? I think so many of us, myself included, walk around life trying to be the best of other people, right? You, and, and social media does so much for that. Like you, you see these parts of people's lives that are like the best of themselves most of the time. And then we try to emulate that. And yet trying to understand and find who you are first and foremost, and the way that God has created us, it's, it's so important. And that's such a journey that, right. We are still on as adults and, and just watching students in youth ministry, whether it's junior hires or ninth and 10th graders, like that is absolutely our desire so often for our students and and our leaders desire for our students is like, Hey, find, find who you are and who God has created you to be. And that's really what the gospel does for us. Right. Like, and this is, this is kind of a cool pivot into what we're talking about in nine ten right now. We're in a series called by grace and it's really been our push to, understand our last series was about who God is. And we looked at Exodus 34 and Isaiah chapter six and um, Revelation four and five, this, these throne room scenes where we just get this really big picture of who God is. And then we start reading passages that we can approach God with this boldness, right? Like Hebrews talks about, or even in Ephesians chapter three, it says we have this confidence and this freedom to walk into the throne room of God And then he says, he prays for the church of Ephesus, just going like, I want you to experience this grace and this fullness and this peace that it surpasses our understanding, surpasses our knowledge. I'm curious for you, Kristen, what, what has grace, or I guess, how has grace been a big part of you finding your voice and finding who you are? Because we've taught it a million times, right? You've been in youth ministry for 17 years you, you know, the gospel up here, right? You know, you could define grace for me, you could pass the quiz. And yet, how does that play a role in what you were just talking about? Like, I, I'm trying to find my voice and who I am and how, what God's created me to be. And, and the gospel is at the very center of that. How, how has that played out for you? That's a really good question. And the way you ask it, it's like, well, yeah, I mean, we know the answer, but like, what does it mean? And like, so I don't know if you guys talk much about the Enneagram in nine ten, or if your students even know their number or any of that, but I'm an Enneagram three. If you're not familiar with it, it's the achiever. <laughs> are, what are you, Austin? I'm a, I'm a seven, but my wife's a three. Okay. So, so you, you know, I know. Yeah. And on top of that, I'm a type A, not just type A, like type A plus personality. So just to unpack a little bit about what that means is um, like, I just have very high expectations for myself and I can be really, really hard on myself in terms of perfectionism. And like, if I don't think I can do something well, I either won't do it or I'll, you know, obsess about it until I can do it perfectly. And so I think like my biggest struggle and this it's to put it in the frame of grace, like one of my biggest struggles is just perpetual guilt and guilt over everything. So um, Mm -hmm. guilt over things I did when I was 16 years old, right? Like gotten into relationships that I shouldn't have or something I did at a party that I shouldn't have. And like that guilt resurfacing all the time or guilt over um, snapping at my kids. And I will, I'll tell my husband every night I have the shower of guilt. Like the kids go to bed, then I get in the shower, like I'm getting ready for bed. And I just sit there and I'm like, I'm the worst. I'm the worst mom. Like, God, please protect my children from me. I'm horrible. Mm-hmm. Um, guilt over work performance of like, I, that wasn't very good. I could have done better. I didn't work hard enough. And so my natural bent is always toward performance and like work hard and make it happen or work really hard and produce something great. A three wants to produce. And like, we see our identity. I'm as good as what I 
produce or can give or can contribute. Like we never want to be like the slacker or the burden or the like, you know, deadbeat over here that doesn't know what they're doing, but we want to be like reporting for duty and you won't be sorry you asked me. (laughs) And that's where we find value. And over the years, I've really struggled to give grace to myself and to translate that God is still proud of me. And it was a conversation I had with um, my daughter. She's like the seven-year-old. She's the most amazing person I've ever met. And she said, we were talking and she had made a mistake. I don't even remember what it was. And I said, Annika, like, relax. Like nobody is perfect. And she said, you are. And I'm like, no, I'm not. What are you talking about? Like I snap at you guys all the time. And she goes, it doesn't matter to me, you are. And it was like this moment of like seeing myself through the way she saw me. And I beat myself up every single day of like, I suck. I yell, I get impatient. Like, why can't I just relax? And then to see myself through her eyes of like, well, to me, you're perfect because she loves me so much. And that just gave me a glimpse into like how God sees me of like, he doesn't, he knows I'm not perfect, but the, because of my relationship with Jesus, like, you know, how the Bible says, like, like we have the righteousness of Christ because of that. Yet all I can ever see is what I didn't do well enough, what I should have done better, where I dropped the ball because the expectations are so high. So I wouldn't say I've arrived at like, but now I know the secret of grace. Like I would say, Austin, I'm telling you all of this as like this constant struggle of grasping God's grace. Do I know I'm forgiven? Yes, do I still go back and guilt trip myself on like, why did I do that? Why did I say that? I shouldn't have said that. Like I will reanalyze everything I did and said in a day and then like give myself points on like, that was horrible. They think you're stupid. This was great. Good job. You're the best. This was awful. Like you're the worst, you know? And like, I grade myself all the time and for God to always be nudging me toward like be gentle you know, with yourself. And I love that verse where he says, my mercy is new for you every morning. It's like every morning, let's give it another try. Like, um, you know, when it comes down to like my heart, I'm not like, you know, like there's this tension with grace sometimes of like, ah, like grace, like God's got it, whatever. And then there's the other side where you're like, why can't I grasp that it's mine? (laughs) You know, it's like either totally it's abusive on both, both ends, you know? Right. Um, Right. And that's actually what I want to, I want to finish up here talking about. I want to read this verse for you. And this was a a point we hit on in our podcast this weekend. And I really want to reemphasize it because right after this, our students are going into life groups. And I think this is such an important topic to end on here. And Ephesians 3, the prayer for the Ephesians, Paul says, um, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide, how long, how high, how deep is the love of Christ. And to know that this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. And I think to your point, right, when we start understanding how how great God's love for us, and I love how Paul puts it, right? It's like how deep, how long, how wide, like what, what do we want to talk about? Do we want to talk about height? Do we want to talk about depth? Like, do we want to talk about how wide it is? Like, it's all of those things. And, and really to his point, he's he's getting at, I've established this understanding of the good news of grace, that God has the power to take dead things that is us without Jesus and bring them to life and now as you live into that, it has to be from this place of identity of firmly knowing that God's love for me is not dependent on my performance. And yet to your point, and this is kind of what I want to close on. I think we, as people have a tendency to pendulum swing, right? Like we, we have a really hard time finding the middle ground on anything. And especially with this topic, right? Depending on our personality, depending on our upbringing, depending on our experience with church, 
grace seems to be something that where we go like, well, it doesn't really matter what I do because God's got it right. Like his, he loves me. Therefore in his eyes, I'm perfect because of Jesus' righteousness and the gospel. So what I do doesn't really matter. And yeah, I messed up, but oh, well. Right. And, and we kind of like, we narrow the gap between us and God and we go, God's not that great. I'm not that bad. And it, it becomes this like cheap grace. But on the other side of it is this like pharisaical woe is me. Like I'm never good enough for God. I try, 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 try. And my church attendance is super important to me. And I wrestle with shame and guilt all the time. And it feels like those two things are like these polar extremes just it, man, in our last couple of minutes here, as we wrap up, what would you say to the ninth and 10th grader on either side of those extremes going like, I feel shame and guilt all the time, or I don't really feel that bad because I'm not that bad. And like God's grace covers me. It feels like those are two polar opposites. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I would say what I really learned, because some of that used to like even keep me up at night. You know, we could do a whole other thing on who I was from the ages of 15 to 18. <laughs> like, whoa, you know, and then <laughs> those sins would like kind of haunt me as a Christian and they would keep me up at night. And I, these verses would like go in my head of like, and you shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And I'm like, that's me. I'm that person, you know? <laughs> And then learning what that spiritual, that like, there's an, a, there's a battle going on for your mind and there's a battle going on for your heart. And it, Satan is called the accuser for a reason because he lies to us constantly and, <clears throat> you know, fighting those thoughts with scripture, you know, I would have to just like hone in and remind myself of God's promises of like, <clears throat> no, like, um, like Jesus paid it in full. He separates your sin as far as the East is from the West. He remembers it no more forgive. Like what he tells the disciples about forgiveness is that it never runs out. You just keep doing it over and over and over again and being able to hear the voice of God versus <clears throat> the, the lies from the enemy or from yourself and differentiating those voices and that, that took a lot for me. And it was, I mean, <clears throat> I think we forget the importance of hearing God's voice. So if you're a ninth or 10th grader that never reads their Bible, that never studies scripture on their own guys, we need it like hourly. We need God's truth to override lies hourly. It's not enough to like, you know, Austin and the whole nine, 10 staff are incredible, but when you only see them once a week, it's like, it's not enough. So I had to be so disciplined about hearing God's voice because that was the only thing that would override that guilt and shame because after a while I couldn't hear it anymore. I, the lies were so loud and they compounded themselves. And then for the one who's like, whatever, God's got it. Like, I feel, I don't, you know, like if you are um, abusive to God's grace of doing, you know, whatever you want. Um, I think that's kind of like a relationship status check. You know, you don't hurt the one you love over and over and over again with no remorse. Like, I mean, if you get mad at Paige, you know, she's going to forgive you. Or if you guys get in a little squabble or something, I mean, for the most part, like you guys will move on. But if this is this daily habit, like where we're, just like, oh, well, she's not going to leave me. It's okay. It's like, how much do you love this person? And right. I think that's where it starts is, you know, do we love God or are we in some like try to be good club? You know, it's like, ah, oh, we try to be good, but we don't. And then it's like, whatever, because God forgives us. It's like, I don't know that that is loving our God. Right. And that's right. kind of the first command, right? Jesus says, love me love others, right. everything else yeah. kind of fits in there. So I love that analogy with marriage, right. And, and even like friendship or call it a dating relationship. And, and sometimes I think we have this gap between our understanding of relationships with people around us and our understanding of relationship with God. And yet I think the relational principles apply more often than not of, yeah, like I think so often high school students and probably junior high students, like they're aim in Christianity is behavior modification. 
I'm going like, I'm trying to be good. Like I'm, I'm trying not to be bad. And it's like, just imagine, just put that lens on with a friendship or a dating relationship or a marriage. You know, if it's like, I was constantly acting out against Paige and it's like, "Ah, babe, I'm trying not to, like, I'm trying not to, like, at what point is it like, do you, do you actually love me? And is there a commitment to me? Is there a relationship here? Or are you just trying to like check boxes of like being good at husband or being good at, you know, fill in the blank friendship or boyfriend or girlfriend. Right. You know, which is exhausting. It's like any time we just simply focus on behavior modification, it's exhausting. But when we're motivated from love and I love that God says that I'm just going like, it's, it's not that you loved me, right? First John says, it says, love is not that you have been, has done something for me. I am love and my love acts first and anything, any bit of love you have is simply a response to me. And I think that's a grace gift in and of itself of God going like respond to the greatest love story of all time. And it's free. It's this gift that I have given to you. I have, I took my entire Bible to tell this story of what I've done to get to you. And now your life is a response to that love, not a list of like trying to alter certain behaviors. And really for me, you said from 15 to 18, for me, it was probably like 18 to 21. It, there's so many of those times that I look back on and I'm like, golly, like I was just missing it. Like, so, so missing it. And yet at the time thinking like, this is it, like, this is it's, I'm having fun. I'm having a good time. Like the world is my oyster. I have the world at my fingertips and thinking like, I'm never not going to want these things. And now looking back on it and going like watching my, the way that my appetites have changed, the way that like my desires have changed, my definition of fun and satisfaction and all those things. And I really think God peels back the layers of our eyes and starts under, like showing us through relationship of what it looks like to walk with him and behavior modification kind of stops being a thing. And it's like, it's for sure. It might look like the same thing on the surface. So it might be the same action and yet it's coming from such a different identity place. It's a different heart place. And that's cool. I love that response there, but man, Kristen, thank you so much for gracing us with your presence today. Uh, It's so fun to have you speak into 910 and just the wealth of wisdom that is 17 years of youth ministry and nine years of marriage and years as a mom and a doxy lover and <laughs> an avocado t-shirt printing. We didn't even get into that and your relationship with Jason Mraz and how well you know him. Um, I'm yours is actually written about you. No, I'm just kidding. Let's just um, leave that as a cliffhanger. And just like, yeah, it's, it's a we mystery. don't know. It's, we don't know. It's a mystery. <laughs> but seriously, Kristen, thank you so much. Um, 910 loves you. And thank you for being with us today. Thanks for having me. Bye.